To have known John was to have known, uh, in my opinion, a real gentleman. I found it so fascinating that, you know, that Laughlin came to his art, you know, after another career. He was in the intelligence in the military, and he was in Japan, where he got exposed to Japanese art, which is really seductive for us Westerners. When John started painting, he was late in age, and he went through, uh, in a kind of sense, Western painting. I mean, he went through uh, early constructivism and, you know, Belevich and uh, uh, Mondrian and so on. But uh, at the same time, when you see one of his paintings, you know it's his, don't you? Why is that? What he arrived at was a depth of feeling that he had, but I don't think it was particularly competitive. I love that he wasn't, you know, driven to be in the center of things. They feel very unlike L.A. They're not glamorous, they're not shiny, they're not immediately seductive, they're not ambitious in a certain way. He, he didn't seem to have any, what, compulsion or requirement on his part to get out and so forth. At that late date in his life, he was very self-disciplined, and uh, he came to Dana Point and settled there. And, you know, living in funny Dana Point in this place is just where he chose to be, and there wasn't, you know, a, a sense of drive and a need to be in the center of everything, which obviously, you know, kind of impacted his place within the art world. And uh, Joe Good said he was always surprised that he would drive from way down south to come to a party in Hollywood. And that he was very friendly, but he was separated and quite formal and quite erect in his uh, physical bearing. He had a mustache. Had a good English quality about him, formal, sort of like a, a judge, maybe. He enjoyed conversation, and he enjoyed very much talking to younger artists. There's a 60s kind of period where he was, I th think he was aware of what was going on in the art world. Previously, he had been into Asian art, that was his, but at a certain point, he became aware of contemporary art, and I think it influenced him. I think it made him better. It, it made him more sophisticated. You know, I, I have, where is it? I have something here. Which I was going to show you that this, <laughs> this, is a, this is a letter, a note John sent to me one day. Tony, here's a sample of what I use for canvas. It comes in 60 inch by whatever you wish. I get it in 15 yard lots. Their cost is $2.20 per yard. The catalog, and then he indicates the number of the catalog, Sears Roebuck. I really enjoyed Tuesday, John. <laughs> that's the that's the canvas. He bought his canvas from John's from Sears Roebuck. He was self-taught in the sense that he had a way he wanted it to be, probably, and that had some in, you know internal intuitive rightness to him, and he was trying to figure out techniques as to how to do it. But I think that John's painting was really a visual language. And I think that what the painting said was what you saw. He was very reductive. He removed all the excess material. They were just fundamental and abstract in the best sense of the word, non-imagist. In abstract painting, you kind of empty everything out that's extraneous. And with someone like McLaughlin, there wasn't much that was essential. You, uh, it's easy to empty a painting out. It's difficult to fill it with nothing and do it in an elegant way, but McLaughlin did that. I mean, they're extremely sophisticated 
paintings that are simply deceptively simple, right? And it seems like you could just decide to like paint some black stripes on a canvas, like two black stripes or, you know, a black three rectangles or whatever, and have it be engaging and compelling and intriguing to look at. And I think that artists know that that is really hard to do, right? Uh, to not just look sort of trivial. He wasn't hesitant about doing something. I'd known other artists such as Barnett Newman who would also use vertical lines and, you know, but something about McLaughlin, he wasn't outstanding, he wasn't yelling out with the paintings. I still feel he was very self-contained that when he made a painting, he was into his self and, in, and working with that painting directly from his feelings. And I admired that he must have calculated very carefully each of the spaces that he used, the spacing between verticals. I really had to admire these very small decisions that create the painting, they create the feeling and the rightness somehow of the painting. I feel that he must have worked very much with that. There's such a basic process, just staining and making divisions. And the field was the painting. In other words, the part that wasn't painted was part of the painting. McLaughlin wanted to have the sense that his work um, wasn't about him as a personality and that it didn't carry a specific message it, it just provided a format. In a lot of ways, he took the ego out of his painting. Abstract, no, no reaction to anything else. It's just itself and nothing else. It had a kind of substance. It, it came so close to being right that other people gave up trying. It was so close to perfect that Young people just go, why should I bother? You know, I can't do better than that. He sets up certain parameters. He sets up certain parameters and then one painting slightly changes from another. And, and I really like the straightforwardness that he presents his paintings to the viewer. There's no, there's not trickery. He, he, he puts something out there and asks like uh, himself as well as you, this is what this is. What is this? How does it feel? And then to the next painting, what, if it's changed a little bit like this, how does that feel? I just feel like he doesn't play down to the viewer. It's, it's very direct. Well, the sense of process I see is just in the sequence of looking at a lot of them. If I just saw one, I wouldn't uh, see a kind of process of variation on the theme of the rectangle and how you divide the rectangle. When you see them all, you can see they don't look tricky ever. They all look like they just fell into place. I was interested in the early ones and interested to see how they gradually became very calm, very fixed. He removed all the references, no references, just black and white, yim and yam. Isn't that what the Japanese call it? Yin and yang, not him and yam. And I had the same sense in looking at the other um, hard, hard edge, so called hard edge artists. I thought he had gone farther toward quietness and wholeness and so on than they had generally. His experiences with Eastern art fused with, in a kind of way, how to make a painting by Western influence made it something that was extremely contemplative. It wouldn't surprise me if he looked at this as a, as a certain kind of spiritual practice. Um, I imagine that he got tremendous satisfaction doing this kind of work. I think the repeating motifs and the repeating colors uh, ha had to have been uh, meditative and sometimes um, a commitment to time and to a practice, a very still practice, um, 
leads to a different way of, uh, of, of thinking. And I think it was rigorous enough that my guess is while he was making these, uh, and this is my experience of, of when, when I've, I've made geometric abstraction, is that enough stuff can be firing in that, enough hyper concentration that you do lose yourself into that void. Um, and of course, that's like the best thing when you lose yourself and you go into that and you, and you fall into that thing. It's hard to believe that, that he had a lot of metaphysical concerns. Being a formalist, that's interesting, isn't it? The Japanese brought on the metaphysical concerns. I mean, I, I, you know, I think they clearly, in my mind, were meditations for him and that it was partly about his time painting them in slowness. So I think there is a lot um, that maybe isn't central to what he was doing, but very significant in the way the paint is applied and the kind of kind of modesty and carefulness. And you know, it wasn't about sort of masking off and just getting the graphic look of it. It was about how to carefully, you know, create the, the, the lines. The way that he paints, the individual paints, is just really beautiful. The way the paint leaves the edge, or here where you can see the way that one color meets the other. It's really lovingly done in pretty much all the paintings pretty much all the paintings across the board, just in my opinion, a real love of material. I've had the opportunity to look at a McLaughlin across the surface. And when you look at, like when a carpenter's building something, you look at wood to sight it for its, the bow and the warp. Uh, but you can get down and look at a line in a, in a McLaughlin and it's very organic. It's not stiff and rigid, like it's been marked off with tape. You know, it's uh, very organic. Yeah, uh, he painted them. They were, you know, they were about paint. More than that, I, I, I think what he was trying to achieve with the compositions was a um, exploration of figure ground, you know, which is just sort of a very basic aspect of any, you know, art making. For me, I, I think understanding figure and ground is sort of about understanding how to be because life is sort of about making a decision you know what is in front of and what's the primary and what's the backdrop for that and i think that you go through life just making you know some version of figure ground decisions on a daily basis of his and he found a way to actually get them both in, in, in tension and in balance between those two things. The surface of a painting, in a weird way, is almost like a diary. And, but what it records is the artist's time and energy. And it, it's the same surface over and over, but the more energy and time you give it, the more presence that surface attains to where that, that surface can actually be in the room there with you, almost ready to carry on a conversation with you. And I do believe that when the composition interested him, he gave that composition more of himself, more energy. I just found myself fixated on one when I was at a house and found some, somewhere I found that I could stand and really love looking at it. And because he wasn't that celebrated, the paintings were usually like in a back bedroom or somewhere. Uh, where you could go away from the party and there were no distractions uh, and no one uh, had opinions that they were voicing so I was able to have this real one-on-one -on -one experience and then it, it was so satisfactory that every time I saw one somewhere I made a point of I was involuntarily uh, committed to looking at it. This extremely careful proportions of the rectangular spaces he was articulating. Well, it's just a neurological format that we like. And uh, the brain, based on neurological research, shows that the brain gets highly excited by the rectangle, but particularly activated neurologically, meaning all the different parts of the brain are firing simultaneously when the rectangle is altered slightly. So that it's a, um, kind of an enigmatic, slightly puzzling situation, but not something that's frustrating to figure out, something that you can uh, deal with and understand. 
But really, I don't know why they're so good. But he didn't have that kind of head or attitude that, well, I'm going to do a real killer thing now. I'm going to make something, you know, you know, like that last painting, only really big and so forth. And the scale of McLaughlin's works, which is, you know, it feels like, you know, the size of the paintings are just, just right. You know, they're big enough to sort of exist on a wall, but they're not, you know, trying to be heroic or take too much space. So there's certain modesty in the scale of this stuff. The, the black and white paintings do seem much more assertive than the smaller colored ones. The smaller colored ones really have a kind of an affinity to Albers and, and feel like that. And when they get bigger like this, they have a real kind of uh, kinesthetic sense of scale to the scale of the viewer, to my scale, when I stand in front of it. But, he, I mean, he clearly had a significant relationship to color and what color was doing and, and that it has both sort of spatial perceptual content and then the other content that color has, which is kind of like more emotional and personal and brings up feelings in people. When he got it right, he got it so right. It, it's memorable, it lives in your brain, stuck up there. I like art that stays in your brain. I don't really know. All I know is that when you look at it, you know he did it. <laughs> Why is that? Well, that's, that's the visual language, isn't it? Is there anybody who doesn't like McLaughlin? <laughs> I mean, there really isn't, right? Anybody who has spent time with his work, you come out of it really respecting it, I think. I mean, I think it's as difficult once as when somebody says, why do you love this person, or why do you love this woman, or why didn't the marriage work out, or why, what, it's hard to really, I guess I'm most attracted to the works of art that are uh, inexplicable, and that can only be understood, can clearly be understood by having the experience, but that the experience can't really be turned into a uh, articulated uh, word equivalent. This is all set up to give people some kind of explained access. And here I'm saying there is, there, abandon any sense of responsibility in the experience. And just give yourself permission uh, to respond. And if you don't respond, give yourself permission to walk away without feeling inadequate. Because there's plenty to look at in the, in the world. If he gets to live another 50 years, like, does that mean it goes straight to Ryman? You know, I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's a good journey. He had a really good journey in painting. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that there's a show here where we can really see that journey.